Well, uh, I want to share with you today from Acts chapter 28. We'll begin reading at verse 16. Luke is uh, the author here, and he is part of uh, Paul's uh, traveling uh, group, and he writes this. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from here, uh, from there has reported or said anything bad about you, but we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave Paul after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for his word. Guys, I'm getting a little ring. I'm, I'm hearing a little feedback there. Thank you. The title of my message today is, While You're Waiting. While You're Waiting. There are times in life when we wait for things to happen. Like right now, when we're waiting for this pandemic to be over. How many would join with me in that? I think all of us would. In this passage that we're looking at today, Paul experienced a time of waiting. The Jews had accused him of violating their laws, which he didn't do, and so as a Roman citizen he had the right to appeal to Caesar, the Roman emperor, which he did. This led to his journey to Rome. Also, as a Roman citizen, Paul had the right to have his case heard within a certain period of time. Some have speculated that it, Paul's accusers reasoned that if they were unsuccessful in making a case against Paul in Jerusalem, as they had been, they would even have less of a chance in Rome. And this Roman government dealt harshly with prosecutors who brought frivolous cases. So because of this, it was questionable whether or not Paul's accusers would ever make their way to Rome. So Paul waited. Verse 30 tells us he was under house arrest for two full years waiting to find out his fate. He lived in a rented house chained to a Roman guard the whole time. Waiting. Can you imagine? For two solid years. Perhaps this morning you can identify with Paul. Maybe you're in a situation where you're chained not to a Roman guard, but to your circumstances. Circumstances that seem unfair. Waiting for something positive to happen. And the wait seems to last forever, doesn't it? Life is filled with times of waiting. 
Michael Hyatt, pastor and author of the best-selling book, Living Forward, A Proven Plan to Stop Drifting and Get the Life You've Always Wanted, says this. He says, waiting is not incidental to faith. Waiting is the DNA of faith. We don't like to hear that, though, do we? Because we don't like to wait. I imagine, I don't have to imagine, I know, as I said, that during this crazy year we're living in, there are a lot of people waiting for some things to happen. Waiting for things to change. If any of us find ourselves in a place of waiting today, I believe we can learn something from the Apostle Paul's waiting experience. So, in this message I've entitled, While You're Waiting, I want to encourage you today, and I want to answer this question, what do you need to do while you're waiting for something to happen in your life? And for some, that question may seem a little odd. What do you, want, what do you need to do when you're waiting? You're waiting. But how many know waiting is not the equivalent of doing nothing? Hence the title of the message, While You're Waiting. What do you need to do while you're waiting for something to happen in your life? The first thing uh, we learn is this. You, while you're waiting, you need to fulfill your calling every way possible. Fulfill your calling every way possible. The Apostle Paul didn't just sit around while waiting for something to happen in his life. He initiated contact with the Jewish leaders in Rome and he told them his story denying the charges against him. They said they hadn't heard about the charges against Paul, but wanted to hear his views on Christianity, about which they knew very little. So they arranged a meeting with him in which Paul spent an entire day teaching them from the scriptures about the kingdom of God and about Jesus. Paul was active, he was busy during his time of waiting. Consider all that God accomplished through Paul during this period of waiting. This is, this is uh, profound. Uh, during this time of waiting, Paul wrote what are known as his prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Imagine if Paul didn't have this time of waiting. We may not have had those books. Also during his waiting period, according to Philippians 1, his testimony circulated through the uh, palace guards, through the palace guards who were chained to him in ships. He got to spread the gospel in Caesar's palace itself. Also, according to Philippians 1, his bold testimony encouraged other believers to be bold in their witness as well. Uh, during this time, he was used by God to convert Onesimus, a runaway slave, as he writes about in his letter to Philemon. So though this was a period of waiting for Paul... He was productive during that time. His mindset here is evident from what he wrote to the Colossians during his imprisonment. Listen to this. In Colossians 4, verses 3 and 4, he wrote this. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Notice something about this prayer during his time of waiting. His prayer wasn't that the time of waiting would be over. His prayer wasn't that he would be released from his chains. His prayer that he would, was that he would be able to boldly proclaim the gospel. In other words, that he would fulfill his calling even during his time of waiting. In the 11th century, King Henry III of Bavaria grew tired of court life and the pressures of being a monarch. So he made an application to uh, Prior Richard at a local monastery asking to be accepted as a monk and spend the rest of his life in a monastery. That would be some transition, wouldn't it? From being a king to being a, a, becoming a monk. Your majesty, said Prior Richard, do you understand that the pledge here is one of obedience? That will be very hard since you've been a king. I understand, said Henry, the rest of my life I will be obedient to you as Christ leads you. Then I will tell you what to do, said Prior Richard. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God has put you. When King Henry died, a statement was written that said this, The king learned to rule 
by being obedient. You see, when we tire of our roles and responsibilities, especially during a time of waiting, it helps to remember that God has planted us in a certain place and told us to be a good accountant or teacher or mother or father or member of the military uh, or whatever our role is. He's told us to be good at that. Christ expects us, in other words, to be faithful where he puts us. You see, there's no exemption to fulfilling our calling just because we're in a time of waiting. Well, you know, I know God wants me to do this and God wants, wants me to do that, but just, you know, as soon as this pandemic is over, as soon as things get back to normal, what if things never get back to normal, what we know is normal? Have you, have you pondered that? I know we have. We're all wondering, when, when, when is this going to end? Everything's going to go back to the way it was. Well, I hope soon, but maybe never. So are we going to, well, God, I'm sorry. Lord, I really wanted to accomplish something great for you, but you allowed this pandemic, so. No, God can accomplish extraordinary things through you and me, as he did through Paul, during our time of waiting. If we remember this, that our lives are about fulfilling his purpose, not about our plans. Do we catch that? I'm going to say that again. Our lives are about fulfilling his purpose, not our plans. See, if we're focused on our agenda and our plans and when things are going to get, get back to normal so we can do our thing, then we're not going to fulfill God's purpose for our lives. But if our purpose is to fulfill God's purpose for our lives, that goes on no matter how long our period of waiting is. Amen? While you're waiting for something to happen, continue to do what you know to do. So the first thing to do while you're waiting is to continue to fulfill God's purpose for your life. What's God called you to do? What's God's purpose for your life? What would God have you to do in your situation where you're planted, in your, the context of your life? Are you serving him to the best of your ability? Are you making a difference? Are you sharing the gospel? Are you being a light? While you're waiting, fulfill your calling the best you can. What's the second thing you need to do while you're waiting for something to happen in your life? Refuse to compromise biblical principles. Refuse to compromise biblical principles. It becomes easy to give into the temptation to compromise our biblical principles when the pressure is on. Paul refused to compromise the truth of Scripture to appease his audience. His teaching received a mixed reaction, some hearers being convinced and others refusing to believe. But Paul didn't back down. Notice in verse 31 here of Acts 28 that the core of his message, the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ, stayed the same after this lukewarm reaction and for all of his time in Rome. His message didn't change. Neither should ours. In fact, Paul expected their rejection. He quoted Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, which prophesied that the Jewish people of the time were spiritually dull and would therefore reject the word of the Lord. Does that sound familiar? That sounds like 2020, doesn't it? I'm not just talking about the Jewish people. Jesus also quoted this passage when he was asked why he taught in parables. He used this scripture from Isaiah to refer to those who were so spiritually blind that they would never accept him as Messiah, no matter how clearly the Old Testament prophecies pointed to him. Not only was Paul's message rejected by many, Jesus himself was rejected by many. Throughout history, there have always been uh, those who could not accept the biblical truth that Jesus is the only way to God the Father and or that the morals and values of God's believers to compromise biblical principles to satisfy the skeptics or to change 
our circumstances. However, we make these compromises at our own peril. I have seen, and many of you have too, Christian believers, friends of mine, who have gone online and compromised biblical principles in order to gain acceptance. They have validated immoral lifestyles in order to gain acceptance. That has never been something that God will allow or will wink at. Don't allow your time of waiting to cause you to compromise biblical principles. We can't afford to do that, not even 1%. What if, what if 99% in life was good enough? That means you would have no phone service for 15 minutes a day on your mobile phone. I know some of you, you couldn't live for 15 seconds without access to your mobile phone. If 99% if were good enough, 1.7 million pieces of first class mail would be lost every day. What if, what if you're waiting for a check in the mail and that's one of the 1.7 million? Would 99% be good enough 99% success rate be good enough then? 35,000 newborn babies would be dropped by doctors or nurses each year. Kathy works in that field. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? If 99% were good enough? If 99% were good enough, 200,000 people getting the wrong, or would get the wrong drug prescriptions every year. If 99% were good enough, unsafe drinking water, there, there'd be unsafe drinking water three days a year. Might that be today? If 99% uh, if, uh, if were good enough, there'd be three misspelled words on the average page of type. Of course, I've seen some uh, writing online. Three might be optimistic. That, you know. If 99% were good enough, two million people would die from food poisoning each year. Can we afford to be 99% faithful to our biblical principles? Can we afford to compromise even 1% of the truth of the Word of God? I don't think we can. Listen, pandemic or not, time of waiting or not, economic downturn or not, conflict or not, we can't advance the gospel by watering it down. Now, we, we need to be loving we need to be compassionate. We, we certainly can't be self, we have nothing to be self-righteous about. But we can't advance the gospel. We can't make it more palatable to people by watering it down. It's been said that the same sun that melts ice hardens clay. People will either be warmed by the hope of the gospel or harden their hearts against its message. But a compromised gospel saves no one. Also, you may be tempted to end your waiting period by compromising your Christian values, but if you do, it won't turn out well for you. You say, what do you mean, Pastor Tim? Well, you may lower your standards to find a husband or wife, but that spouse won't be the person God has for you. You may push your integrity to the side to get that job or that promotion, but it won't be the job that God has for you. You may agree with popular notions of morality on social media, I just referenced that, so you don't lose your friends, but if you do that, they're not the friends God wants you to have. Church, we need to resist the temptation to compromise even a little bit the truth of the gospel and our biblical values to make it more acceptable to the world or to advance us in achieving our agenda. I know it's hard to wait. I know the uncertainty is unsettling at, at, at best. But we can't compromise. Amen? We can't compromise the values of the Word of God. What's the third thing uh, you and I need to do during our time of waiting is this. Have confidence that God will open doors. Have confidence that God will open doors. Paul's regular practice during his missionary journeys was to first go to a city synagogue to meet with the Jews out of respect for them as God's chosen people. 
When he inevitably received a mixed reaction at best, he would then go to the non-Jews, the Gentiles of the city, and share the gospel with them. His pattern here in Rome was basically the same, here in Acts 28. After meeting with the Jewish leaders of Rome and declaring that their rejection of the gospel was a fulfillment of prophecy, he boldly states that the Gentiles will be more receptive. He wasn't dissuaded by the rejection of his message, but had faith that God would open other doors for him. And God did exactly that. Paul shared the gospel boldly and without hindrance, as the text says, to all who came to see him for the next two years. But notice this. Paul was still a prisoner. He still had a possible trial, conviction, and death sentence hanging over his head. The irony here is that though Paul was confined behind closed doors, he considered this an open door. Why? Because it wasn't about him. It wasn't about his chains. It wasn't about his circumstances. It wasn't about his time of waiting. It was about the kingdom of God. Do you see how that, that mindset transforms our experience of waiting. Yes, I may be waiting. Yes, there may be some anxiety. But Lord, it's about you. Lord, you can create open doors in the midst of a period of waiting. So he could write, as he did during this period in Philippians chapter 1, that his earnest expectation and hope was, he said, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life, or death. Most of you know my oldest daughter, Lauren. Uh, Lauren, uh, as, as both our daughters were, Lauren and Stephanie, was raised in a, in a Christian home and uh, she, uh, after high school, felt called to go to uh, Bible college. The, she went to the same college my wife and I did. It was Valley Forge Christian College at the time in Pennsylvania. Now it's the University of Valley Forge. And you know, there are, I met my wife there at college, and uh, you know, there, there were always jokes about, uh, you know, get, uh, ladies going to, to Bible college and getting their MRS degree, you know? And uh, that's, that, that wasn't the reason she went, it wasn't the reason, you know, we went, but, but we, we, we kind of figured, you know, she'd meet a nice Christian young man there and, you know, end up uh, getting married. And she had a great college experience, but that didn't happen. And so she came, she came home from college and uh, got a job, uh, moved back home, got a job at, here at a, at a local church uh, working in the office and uh, re really wanted to get married and raise a family. Um, but... That didn't happen, so she worked in this job for six years. It was a job, it was a good job, but it wasn't a job that was going to lead, it wasn't going to become a career. And uh, wondering, saying to her mom and me, What's, when's something going to happen, you know? When am I going to meet Mr. Wright? When's something going to happen? Not, not just being married, but with her life in general. And then finally she made the decision to pursue her master's degree, and a master's degree in counseling, and she did that. Uh, went through the uh, went through the process at Liberty University, and then she had to do an internship, which meant she had to leave her job, and uh, she, she worked here at the church uh, part time as our children's director while she did her internship, and then she had to trust God for a job after that, and she got a part time job as a Christian school counselor, still wondering when are things going to happen, and uh, she she had graduated college in 2005, and. Uh, Eventually got the, this uh, full-time position of counseling, great job, counselor at a Christian school, still hadn't met anyone. Then, then she met someone, and uh, some, many of you know, she, uh, uh, they, they fell in love and they had a wedding planned in 2017. And uh, a little more than six weeks before the wedding, after the invitations had gone out and the showers had taken, the shower had taken place and, and all that, uh, the wedding was canceled. The relationship ended. And you can imagine how heartbroken she was. And uh, she's, a, she's a licensed professional counselor, but she had to find counseling. Found a good Christian counselor. She, she was devastated, as you can imagine. 
and we were with her. Our hearts were broken for her, and it was something we couldn't fix. And not only was she back to square one, but she had a heartbreak to live with. And man, what a period of waiting. But then God brought a young man into her life, Kevin, and uh, they fell in love. And uh, they were, uh, so they got engaged last fall. We had a big wedding planned for the end of April. Some of you know about that. And then COVID-19 hit. The wedding venue closed. And wow, we're like, again? It wasn't the end of the relationship, but wow. And so um, we ended up about four weeks early. We ended up putting a wedding together right here, a small wedding, because you couldn't have big groups of people then, remember, in April? Small wedding. We had as, a, as beautiful a wedding as we could, and it was beautiful. Uh, four weeks early, because they weren't going to be able to have their big wedding, and they want to get married. And so they got married, and she's living with them. She's probably watching online right now. And, and she's living with her husband in the Chicago area. And... Uh, She's very happy, but that was 15 years of waiting. It was a long time. And yet, as I shared with you, while she was waiting, she was busy for the Lord. She got her master's degree. She served here in the children's ministry, as I said. She, she served and, and helped to direct our youth ministry. She was involved and doing what she knew to do believing for God to open a door. Why this beautiful daughter of mine had to wait so long for her dreams to be fulfilled, I really don't know. But I know that God was faithful during her period of waiting. It's been said that faith isn't really faith until it's tested. Our test of faith is how we handle our time of waiting. God loves us today, but that doesn't mean he'll work things out the way we want him to or in the timetable we want him to. But if we're fully surrendered to God's purpose for our lives, we can be confident today that he will open doors for us to live out that purpose. Do you believe that this morning? I believe that's what we should pray and believe for. I have uh, one brief illustration and then I'll close. Uh, it's said that the Chinese bamboo tree is one of the most remarkable plants on earth. Once the gardener plants the seed, listen to this, this is fascinating. Once the gardener plants the seed for this Chinese bamboo tree, he will see nothing but a single shoot coming out of the bulb for five full years. Five years, just a single shoot. That tiny shoot, however, needs to have daily food and water. And during all the time that the gardener is caring for that plant, the exterior shoot will grow less than an inch in five years. At the end of five years, however, the Chinese bamboo performs an incredible feat. It grows an amazing 90 feet tall in 90 days. One inch for five years, 90 feet in 90 days. Now ask yourself this, when did the tree actually grow? During the first five years or during the last 90 days? The answer lies in the unseen part of the tree, the underground root system. During the first five years, the root structure spreads deep and wide into the earth, preparing to support the incredible heights that, that tree will reach. You see, the point is this. During times when you're waiting and it seems like nothing has happened, God is working behind the scenes. God is working to bring something beautiful out of your life. You may not see it, you may not feel it, uh, you may not experience it, but he's working to prepare you and me for what's ahead and we need to trust him that he knows what he's doing and that he is going to make something beautiful out of our lives. But in the meantime, we wait. So what do we need to do while we're waiting? We need to first of all fulfill our calling in every way possible. What has God called you to do? What has he called you to achieve for his purpose? Be about the business God's called you to do. Secondly, refuse to compromise biblical principles. Don't compromise your biblical values to get ahead or to make something happen. Every time we do that, it works to our detriment. And number three, have confidence that God will open doors for you in his time. Luke, the author of Acts, ends his story right there in 
chapter 28, verse 31, with Paul sharing the gospel under house arrest. Now, tradition tells us Paul was released at the end of this two-year period and was able to travel and minister for about five more years. His period of waiting came to an end, and yours will also. Just keep doing what you need to do and trust him while you're waiting.